In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Um, so we have a, a few saints, two saints from today, one from yesterday, and then a little bit about, I think in the um, Novus Ordo Church, a feast for today is Our Lady of Egypt, is the flight uh, of, 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 in, into Egypt. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Yesterday was a, um, a feast of St. Macarius the Scot. Remember we heard about Macarius the Younger a few days ago. This is Macarius the Scot. Uh, from yesterday, and today we'll hear about a guy who had dealings with Macarius the Elder. I, I don't know why all these Macariuses, but this is the one from Scotland, and it said that he kept his baptismal innocence his whole life, never committed a single mortal sin. Uh, he was very strict. I was a monk, became an abbot, and he was known for his exceedingly great temperance, especially with alcohol. He would never drink alcohol. Uh, one time, some noblemen invited him to a great feast. And they put in a lot of salty foods and no water. All they put in front of him was wine. They wanted him to break his vow of temperance. And so he's exceedingly thirsty. All he has is, is, is wine around him and all the nobles are, you know, laughing at this great joke. So he bows his head and he prays that the God who turned water into wine would now do the opposite. He makes a sign of the cross over a goblet and he drinks. And they all laugh because like, oh, we got you to break your vow. He hands it to them. It's water. So that was uh, Macarius to Scott. And he died uh, in the year 1153. Oh, interesting. Another story from him, actually. This, this is important. He was visiting the Pope, Pope Eugenius, I think it was. And he, again, he's, he's reclining at dinner with the Pope. And suddenly Macarius bursts into tears. And the post, Pope asks him, Why are, what, are you, what are you crying about? He said, uh, the towers that I have so recently built on my monastery in Scotland at great expense have just fallen to the ground. And later it was found out that was exactly true. And the important lesson there is that this great monk, this great saint, undertook uh, 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 building these towers for God, for the edification of his, his monks in the countryside, great expense, and then they collapsed. The fact that he was a saint didn't, didn't mean he was going to meet with his success, material success, even for a good cause. That's a very important lesson to remember. Uh, so it was a saint from yesterday, Macarius the Scot. A Lucian of Antioch was a, is a saint for today, and he was actually an Arian for a while. He was a heretic. This is in the year um, uh, the, the early 200s, or, or sorry, late 200s, early 300s. One of his students, he was a head of theology at Antioch, one of his students was Arius, the, the arch heretic, founder of Arianism. That was one of his students. And he was friends with another, uh, Paul of Samos, um, Samosota. And they all got excommunicated together. Uh, his friends, Ari, his student Arius, his friend Paul, they didn't, they didn't uh, accept the errors, uh, but Lucian did. He realized the errors of his ways and was reconciled to the church. He's an important uh, biblical uh, scholar in that he wanted to make sure that not one jot or tittle of the law of the scriptures was wrong. So he got ancient manuscripts and he would compare all of them together. And he wanted to make sure that, that not a single article, not a single a and the, but when, you know, those equivalents, he wanted to make sure nothing was wrong in the scriptures. So he was extremely careful to make sure there were no copyist errors. And St. Jerome relied on his work when he was translating his Bible uh, to the, for the Latin Vulgate. And uh, Lucian, this one, his version is known as the Lucian Recension, is what they call that. So important uh, biblical um, contributor to, to, the, to the Bible. Now, he was arrested in the year 303 by Diocletian and thrown into prison for nine years. He was brought out and asked to uh, renounce the faith, absolutely refused. They put him back in for two weeks, no food, no water, uh, uh, dying of thirst there for, for two weeks. Uh, it's like one of the, some of the, the longest time people can go is about two weeks without water before just absolutely dying of thirst. And that's the toughest it's agonizing. But in prison, he would write, uh, It's never been in secret or in some disgraceful way that we adored the unity of God announced to us in Jesus Christ and whose faith is inspired by the Holy Ghost. Yet look how the pagans fear us, that they lead us before kings and tribunes as bound victims. But let them look in the history books and they'll see the miracles which inevitably follow the deaths, our deaths at their hands. 
That's what he write in prison. And then he brought him out after two weeks for his trial, and they interrogated him. They said, what's your name? He said, I'm a Christian. What's your profession? I'm a Christian. What's your, um, uh, who are you? I'm a Christian. What's your origin? Christian. Well, who's your family? Christians. They couldn't get anything out of him, so they just ran him through with the sword. Uh, so that was a, a, a great uh, um, a martyrdom by St. Lucian. But not everybody was like that. This is a gr- a gr- another great saint for today. Poly- Polyuctus of Melitene. He was an official. He was a legionary. He was responsible for rounding up Christians and killing them. He became one through his friend. In fact, the, the straw that broke the camel's back for him, like pushing him over the edge, was his friend um, Nearchus, who, uh, when Nearchus' friend heard, I think this was the persecution of Valerian, that Christians were going to be persecuted everywhere, Nearchus, rather than uh, um, being dismayed, was actually joyful that he, I, we would finally have a chance to give something for Christ. Uh, Poly- Polyuctus was like, okay, that's the last straw. I can't believe how you're reacting. There must be something to this. He himself became a, 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 a Christian at, at that very moment. He was baptized, and in his zeal, he went to the public square where Valerian's edict had been published, and he ripped it to pieces. Uh, and then there was a pagan procession coming through, and he ran. He started smashing the pagan uh, uh, statues in this procession. So they, they mobbed him and threw him into prison. Uh, they were torturing him. Uh, he wouldn't give in. They brought in his family, his wife and his children, to try to induce him to have pity, like for your own sake, for your sake of your family, uh, give up your faith. He refused. His family was in heaven. And so he uh, consummated his martyrdom uh, um, I think by, by beheading. And on his way, on his way to being beheaded, he was so cheerful and so joyful, people converted because of him on his, on his way uh, to being uh, martyred. Now, those are good examples, all those saints, good examples for uh, kind of recent events we're seeing in our country, which is looking like we're going to be having um, a different president for the next four years, and an entirely, with it comes a different culture, anti-God, anti-life, uh, anti-human, essentially. People that don't understand men are men, women are women, uh, they don't know what goodness is, what evil is, uh, so times are not going to be good. Uh, but we really have, going back to the feast today, Uh, Our Lady of Egypt. She went because of Christ. Christ the King was driven out of his own home and country by the very priests and uh, uh, nobles who should have welcomed him. Right? Those Jews who said he's born in Bethlehem, they didn't go to see the King. They didn't go to see the Messiah. Uh, They they stayed put. And then when Herod said, go kill those children, that's when they sent soldiers. Uh, And then, so our Lord grew up in a pagan nation that did not know Christ. Uh, But what what does Scripture say? Out of Egypt I have called my son. It was out of that pagan nation that God called him, and he achieved the salvation of man. So now it's our turn to live in a pagan nation that does not know Christ. Uh, this country, it's not, it's not, we're not fleeing from, you know, Jerusalem to Egypt, from the, la- the promised land back into the land of slavery. We're not geographically moving. Our country has moved. It's moved from a, 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 a Christian nation, a nation that accepts God, the Judeo-Christian way of life. Now it's moving to a pagan land that does not. So our land has moved. We've been rejected. And you look, we look to our priests in the church, and they're part of the problem. Uh, the bishops, the hierarchy, not all, of course, uh, but many in very high positions, driven out. So uh, how fitting on this feast we have to remember that every, any, any event in the life of Christ or any event in our life, any suffer, or suffering or sorrow we have, he has suffered first. And so if we're dismayed at this transfer of power, uh, okay, Christ was driven into Egypt. He grew up in a toxic I- uh, environment. So can we. Uh, no matter how long it takes, God will call us out of Egypt, he'll call us back into the promised land, and he will work our salvation. Uh, So we can pray to our our martyred saints, give us courage, give us zeal, give us prudence. Uh, But our our lady, our Lord, uh, they will save us, they will redeem us, uh, like they always have. Maybe not physically, spiritually always. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost.